Good morning, everyone. I'm Paula Patterson Dilworth, Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And on behalf of UAB and the Alabama Advanced Partnership for Achieving Gender Equity in STEM, which includes our partners at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Alabama A&M University, Miles College, Oakwood University, the University of Alabama at Huntsville, and Auburn University. We welcome you to our advanced symposium this morning. Today, our symposium will feature Dr. Shirley Malcolm, and we are very excited that she gracious, graciously accepted our invitation to be with us this morning. She will speak to us on reimagining our institutions as places where inclusion is the norm and what will it take. Before I introduce Dr. Malcolm, I need to give you some housekeeping instructions. Uh, we will allow questions and answers at the end of the, uh, Dr. Malcolm's talk. So feel free to post your questions in the Q&A section on the webinar. Dr. Malcolm has had a very long and extensive career working in STEM. And I think that it's safe to say that despite decades of intervention efforts and special programs, most STEM fields still do not reflect the diversity within higher education or the talent pool. The lack of equity and inclusion within STEM affect the quality of education, the research agenda, the connections to society and general excellence within these fields. The American Association for the Advancement of Science has developed a systemic strategy to support equity and inclusion in STEM, adapted from the 15-year-old UK program, Athena SWAN, which is demonstrating effectiveness in transforming its STEM landscape. Sea change which stands for STEM equity achievement, aims to support institutional transformation that can help make diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM the norm within US colleges and universities helping institutions get there from here. Dr. Malcolm is a senior advisor and director of Sea change at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the world's largest general science organization. She works to support transformative change in teaching and learning, research and practice to improve the quality and increase access to education and careers in STEM fields. Dr. Malcolm is a trustee of Caltech and a regent of Morgan State University. She has served on the National Science Board, the policymaking body of the National Science Foundation, and on President Clinton's Committee of Advisors on Science and Technology. Dr. Malcolm received her PhD in, in ecology from Penn State University, a master's in zoology from UCLA, and a bachelor's in zoology from the University of Washington. She also holds 17 honorary degrees and serves on boards of the Heinz Endowment, the Public Agenda, the National Math Science Initiative, and Digital Promise. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Malcolm. We're glad to have you. Thanks a lot, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, I want to do a share screen so that I can let you uh, see. One of the things that is really uh, the case is that this disruption of COVID and uh, the kind of reckoning with racism, et cetera, thank you, Hala, uh, is that it allows us to reimagine our institutions. Mm -hmm. We, a lot of things we would not have been allowed to get away with, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, our faculty have been kicking and screaming about anything virtual, <laughs> right? Until they did not have a choice. Right. And I think that that gives you an example of what it is possible to do with, um, in terms of never let a crisis go on, you know, never lose the opportunity to take advantage of a crisis. Okay. One of the things about 2020 is that we never saw this coming. Um, 2020 is expressed as a way of like perfect vision, but we didn't see this coming at all. But it does offer us an opportunity to put new lenses on the work that we have to do and to really reframe what it is that we're doing. Next slide. Um, 
one of the things that Paulette didn't tell you is that I was born and raised in Birmingham. Um, I uh, that's me in my yard in our yard in Collegeville uh, with my sister. And for those of you who've been to Birmingham and know Birmingham, this is a part of North Birmingham. Uh, and uh, that's where I grew up. I'm the little one, okay? Uh, and uh, I remember very clearly uh, thinking about what I was going to do with the rest of my life and having no idea whatsoever. Uh, you just kind of just keep going along with the program. You go to school. You just basically do your courses. So next slide. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I will tell you is that very much my career and my life have been shaped by the convergence of the civil rights movement and Sputnik. Uh, I'm old enough that uh, when I was in the sixth grade, uh, Sputnik was launched and we really actually started experiencing uh, being taught science. And I realized I really like science and I liked math and I was good at it. And I think that kind of turned me toward looking in that particular direction. But the other major thing that happened was that uh, we were in uh, the, the middle of the civil rights movement. Uh, people were very much concerned with being able to vote. Uh, I work with my grandmother. We had a multi-generational household and I would work with my grandmother to get ready to take her literacy test so that she could vote. She and my mother were members of Bethel Baptist Church, which is pictured there. And uh, in, at Christmas night of 1956, uh, I, I experienced my first bombing. And uh, when the church and the parsonage were, uh, the parsonage was completely, completely demolished. And um, Reverend Shuttlesworth, who was the pastor, uh, lived in, uh, they lived in the parsonage and the front room of the parsonage were where he and Mrs. Shuttlesworth were, would sleep. And so it was amazing to all of us that in fact, that he came out of that alive. If the next slide, uh, the next slide, um, the next picture basically uh, situates me in that kind of time and space because that's my grandmother with Reverend Shuttlesworth, hugging him, um, realizing that he had survived the bombing and being overjoyed because of it. And that little face down there in the corner on the right, that's me at age 10. So it wasn't like we were unaware. We were totally aware of what was going on and what was at stake. Uh, and I think that to a certain extent, it made us more committed to education and to trying to do, trying to do whatever could be done in terms of uh, advancing progress for our communities. Next slide. Um, this, my first elementary school was Hudson School in the neighborhood. Uh, I do not have a picture of Hudson. I left Hudson at sixth grade and went to Lewis School, which is still there. That is a modernized, updated, rehabbed version of Lewis School, but it is where I went to school in Birmingham. Hudson School, where I started, is now an EPA Superfund site. Uh, there was a lot of pollution from the, the industry that surrounded us and uh, it has been declared a Superfund site. The next slide shows you my high school, Carver High School, uh, and it too is a Superfund site. So the, the thing that is to be, to be remembered is that there were all of these kinds of things that we had no awareness of. And one of the things that I am grateful to now is that my own training and background within the STEM fields has allowed me to understand a lot more about my childhood and a lot more about the circumstances in which we found ourselves uh, and to understand 
some of the things like cancer clusters and other kinds of aspects that really related to uh, where we lived and how we lived. Next slide. When I finished uh, uh, George Washington Carver High School in 1963, it was the middle of the Children's March. It was a really tumultuous time. And uh, the schools got closed because the kids, most of the kids basically just left. They were at the Children's March. There was my graduation year was just nothing like uh, kids expect now. No prom, we were under martial law and the Children's March. Next slide. Uh, when I graduated from uh, Carver High School, I went to the University of Washington. And it was a culture shock because in the same way that I had always gone to schools, elementary and high school with other black kids, uh, there was almost no African American community on the University of Washington campus. And for sure, there was no black community with on in the STEM section of the University of Washington campus. Next slide. I say this to talk about the fact that we need to think about the kind of the barriers that are presented to all of us as we are trying to bring more women and more minorities and especially women of color into these kinds of spaces within the STEM areas. So what I've done is I've kind of color coded the rest of this presentation. Red, the kind of pinkish red is the problems or the barriers. The green is the opportunities and the yellow things are the variables. It's going to depend on how things work out. The next slide. So in my case, this was a thing of was I ready for higher education in STEM? I was a good student. I got all A's. I finished with all A's from high school. But I wasn't, I knew that I was not sufficiently prepared to be for the school that I had entered. It matters where you go to school. In this particular case, I knew that I was likely to find the deficiencies for the stuff that we didn't get. And so I was prepared to catch up and keep up and that's what you find. And today's students, in many cases, they're not prepared, but where they go to school makes a difference. Uh, if they start in a two-year uh, college, if they start in a four-year college, if they start in a four-year college in STEM, they're more likely to complete. But if they start in a two-year college and they actually finish an associate's degree, they are as likely to complete as if they started in a four-year college but not if they're just basically taking courses randomly, not if they get stuck in the remedial mathematics that drags them down. You, the the uh, students, uh, some moved to predominantly white institutions as I did. Um, the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa wasn't exactly an option for me at that time and UAB didn't exist. Uh, and, but, the HBCUs, uh, even though they serve only a small fraction of all the students, they have a disproportionate impact in terms of turning out students who are successful. And one of the questions is, how is that? Why, what is it that they do? Uh, and that's something that I think that we always have to try to figure out what is it, the, what are the positive things that are being done in order to make this difference? The thing, the good news is that the interest in STEM is just as high by, uh, for women as it is for men. And it's just about as high for students of color as it is for white students. Not as high as for Asian students. There are much higher interest levels within the STEM field. Next slide. So one of the barriers in terms of being ready for higher education, one of the barriers is a standardized test, standardized testing. And there is, there are large differentials uh, amongst, for students of different racial ethnic groups and for men and women within these groups. Women tend to score lower on these standardized tests, even though they get much higher grades than men do. And, um, and uh, students of color tend to underperform white and Asian students on these standardized tests. And that can be a barrier to being able to get into some of our institutions. Or if they can get into the institution, it could be a barrier in terms of getting into some of the programs. 
a lot of places have become more and more restrictive in high and popular programs such as computer science or engineering. But the I know that it's going to look it looks a little strange to see see COVID-19 as an opportunity. But in fact, it, is, it does present an opportunity and in one way that is very interesting. And that is that many of the institutions, knowing how hard it is for these students to get their uh, SAT or ACT scores uh, taken, that it's become optional at many institutions. And I think that in those places where it has become optional, there is an opportunity to basically collect the data and to show the difference that it makes or doesn't uh, in terms of being predictive of the student's success. Uh, the next slide. So the next issue is that of admissions. Uh, the transition from high school to college, and if in, and uh, Dr. Dilworth was talking about the talking about leaving revisited program that she's been watching, and we talk about the transition to from high school to college because in many cases, students have gotten through high school by memorizing, not necessarily by trying to really. Uh, think about the concepts and they can't do that anymore in when they get to college. This is a totally different structure. And that transition is often hard with a lot of students. It's often hard too for students who've been used to getting A's to suddenly not be not getting them. And yet the it's not necessarily a reflection of what they do or don't know, but it it requires that we think about how to communicate to the students who are there, what is actually what this actually means, and also importantly, what it does not. Our institutions aren't necessarily all set up to receive people for its transfers from two-year institutions, whether or not they have completed the associate's degree. But in many cases, especially uh, uh, women who are not sure that they can do it or that they can only take a course at a time. Students of color who are may not uh, have the money and see this as a, a way to kind of test out higher education. Uh, the how what is the pathway for them into four year institutions? And so there is a there is a real need to try to find out who those people are who are coming from elsewhere and to make sure that there are supports that are in place. Uh, a lot of institutions, there are legal challenges, uh, especially in the elite institutions. Uh, no targeting, quote unquote, by race, how one uses race in admissions. Um, that I think that that's an issue for women of color. That's, we, we are going to have to keep our eye on that. Uh, variable issues relate to how you're going to pay for it. Uh, grants or loans. The Pell's, Pell Grants haven't kept up really with the cost of education and the students in many cases must rely on loans and the loans just aren't, um, they're, they're not always equitable in terms of the rates that students are getting from private loans. And in some cases students just basically get worn out and tired in terms of time to degree. Next slide. Uh, talking about leaving revisited, we were talking about this, uh, Dr. Dilworth and I were talking about this. This is a, an absolutely wonderful book. It's a follow up to a book that was published 20 years ago. A study that looked at what happens in our higher education institutions. I, and I think that it really gave rise to the movement to improve the quality of teaching at the undergraduate level. But now in talking about leaving revisited, what it suggests is that we've got to think more systemically and that's really where we're headed in this because you're not always going to be able to fix these things with intervention programs. Next slide. One of the major uh, uh, barriers in terms of the college experience, in many cases our, our students are working, but if they're working too many hours, this is going to be a problem, especially for STEM. Uh, you can't do a 40 hour job and and really do your best work and perform. And yet that's what some of the students are actually trying to do. Um, the, the weed out courses with curve grading, 
uh, that is we, we lose too many students who uh, have the aptitude, the interest, and the capacity to work on this. And so that's the question. How do we begin to uh, see this as an equity issue, see it as an issue that in terms of the barriers that are there? Um, the students who are used to getting good grades, they may say, mm, I don't know about this. I think I better check out of this particular program because I want to go to medical school or I want to go to this school and I can't get there if my grade point isn't good. And so maybe I better major in something that I can do a better job of getting better grades. Um, we aren't always teaching in a way that the Z students know what is in it for them how it relates to their lives, their histories, their communities. They don't always get the encouragement and the mentoring that are needed. And sometimes they find themselves as the only um, in a class, and especially at the higher level programs like in engineering. Um, how do you get supported? How do you find, um, find people who are willing to encourage you and mentor you and help you if you have an interest in continuing in graduate or graduate education or medical school, how do you find a way to get there? And in many cases, the students are coming from families that nobody has ever done this before. And therefore, what is it that we need to provide in terms of guidance and information about what is needed? For example, one of the things that they are gonna need, no matter what they wanna do, if they wanna go on, is someone recommendations from somebody who knows them well. And so this notion of telling them ahead of time, get to know you, the faculty, get to form some kind of a connection or relationship is an important lesson. Next slide. The, um, the issues in graduate and medical education continue. The MCATs and the GREs are barriers. They, uh, the students do not, uh, the women score lower than the men. The students of color score lower than whites. This is the same kind of a thing. But in addition to that, you have the question about uh, the lack of diversity among the faculty. How do you find community? How do you find mentors? In some cases, how do you deal with the kind of the hyper competitiveness that are in so many of these programs? How do you find uh, a research agenda that makes sense to you? How do you find um, uh, people who can help you think through this notion of further education? because a lot of the students think, well, I don't have the money to go to graduate school and not realizing that in graduate programs in STEM, that shouldn't be an issue, that in fact, that there should be support. And uh, they aren't in fact seeing the, the they're not seeing the next steps uh, that are involved in being able to go and to be successful. And that question of how do we, how do we make that happen? Next slide. So in, in terms of the workplace, I think that this is a this is a sobering fact. We are looking, for example, even though we're re in the resident population, women are not showing up in the STEM work, STEM workforce in the levels. And women of color are really not showing up in the STEM workforce. Part of it is the is the, is the, are the inadequate numbers. But part of it is the absence of leadership. And that's one of the things that I think that we need to, in any conversation around advance, we need to talk about leaders and leadership. Uh, and the other issue is that of climate. That is that how are you experiencing the environment um, in which you find yourself? Okay, next. It, we started from a, from a really low place. Uh, when I started in school, I, I mentioned that um, you, you found very few women among the faculty. You didn't find them among the leadership for real. You couldn't even find them within the student body. And a lot of that changed with Title IX when questions, legal questions began to be asked about access and opportunity. But just because we were on the rise did not mean that we stayed on the rise. And you look at that red line, that's computer science. 
That is our high level, our high watermark was in 1985-86 and has been downhill ever since. Even though there are great jobs there, even though there are lots of opportunities there. And a lot of that had to do with culture. And that is the climate of the departments, the climate of the workplaces, the kind of attitudes about what it took in terms of being to what it took to be successful. Next slide. So the question is, what's next? We have had a long time thinking about individual attributes and many of our interventions were organized to fix the women or to fix the students of color. That we talk about things and value things like personal grit or resilience. And I mean, I did grit to a fairly well and I was resilient, but you can't make it all the way through on just that. And so the question then becomes one of what institutional accountability. What is the institution providing? It needs to be providing roadway, roadways, roadmaps, navigational guides, a kind of a GPS to help people understand how you get through this. Interventions are not enough. They're important. They are important and they can be a part of a systemic approach, but the system is the problem. And therefore, the question is, how do you take on the system? Next slide. So what does reimagining look like? And I think that everybody needs to think about their own question of reimagining. What would reimagining look like to you? In some cases, some of you will say, well, <clears throat> reimagining will look like more diverse faculty. Or reimagining would look like more diverse students in our classes who are able to be successful. Or reimagining might be a matter of closer ties to the community. So that people who may be in programs, for example, that can help college feel as is struggling with its environmental justice issues, began to help th those communities address some of these issues. And in so doing, not only attract the students from the communities, but build community support for the work of the institution. Maybe that's what reimagining looks like. So what else does it look like? I think that it looks a lot like team achievement rather than just individual achievement. Individual achievement is great, but team achievement is needed to take on big problems. Big problems that are within our communities aren't necessarily things that individuals ever can solve. It takes groups working together. Maybe it takes shared responsibility. The idea of reaching into communities to help them solve the problems and to let diversity, equity, and inclusion be a frame for the work that we do because systems are the problem, only systemic change can bring about lasting solutions. Next slide. What we all have done in Sea Change is this is what we've started. <clears throat> we've started with the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I propose that reimagining one's institution means figuring out what is there now that presents a barrier to achieving these goals. What is it that keeps you from having diverse faculty or having a diverse student body or having, a, having diversity as a part of a research agenda? What is it that restrains the kind of growth in the direction that you want? One of the things that we do in Sea Change is that it, the Sea Change um, Institute that Dr. Tilworth was talking about, where that talking about leaving course was, that we put in place to introduce the research that is the latest thing that you can then use as you go back into your institutions or into departments when challenge these kinds of long held beliefs that are so baked into the system. In so many cases, people feel like, well, students aren't successful because they either have it or they don't. Guess what? That is a fixed mindset perspective. 
you do not in fact you're not saying that people can learn and then move into another level i think that that is one of the reasons that some of the programs within hbcus have been effective and that is that the existence of a growth mindset within the institutions you can't just depend on where people are and then think well they can't get any higher than that. It is wherever they are, they can go someplace different, someplace else. So the Institute within Sea Change is the place where we try to help institutions build capacity. And that is building the new knowledge base, looking at what has been done, looking at implementation, looking at practices. We have done four of the talking about leaving web events. Three of them are already posted on the site. If you have not been a part of them, you can go back and look at them. The fourth one we just had this week, it will be posted on the site. We're going to have an additional one in October. And then we're going to have a capstone where we take all that research and say, OK, what is the implication of this research in terms of, of institutional change and the changes that you want to make? How can we make this different? OK, so that's the Institute. The community. In a way, what you have represented here within this advanced community is a way to share knowledge, share problems, share strategies, share ideas. You're working within your own institutions, but you're learning from what is going on in other places and reimagining if those things were taken into your institution. And as I said, you have a better chance of getting some of these ideas into your institution during this period of disruption than you will ever have. We can't go back to 2019, it's gone. So going forward, what will it look like? What will all of this look like going forward? So that's the notion of community. The awards process is something that is, it can be a heavy lift for an institution, but it can transform it forever. And in that particular role, it means having institutions go through a process of self-assessment, followed by reflection. What does this mean? And then followed by the creation of an action plan. Where do we go after here? So I want to, to be able to at least present you with a strategy for going forward to be able to pick up where you are and move to this reimagined place where people can in fact be successful and achieve, help all achieve uh, within the STEM fields. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malcolm. That was really, really wonderful. and I was really excited um, to see the strategies that you've shared with us. Um, we don't yet have any questions posted in the Q&A, but I want to start with the question and we really would just ask if you would to talk a little bit more about the Sea Change Initiative, because I think um, that for me, what I'm taking away from that is, that is a space where this work is being reimagined, right. um, especially when it comes to um, creating a space where more people are included. Um, I just said just yesterday, um, talking, I think it was yesterday, talking to some students um, that DEI as a field is becoming its own science that really needs to be studied and reimagined in terms of um, the success that we're having. And part of my rationale for thinking that is because, and you and I had this conversation when I was talking to you about today. We've had so many initiatives. NSF has poured a lot of money into advance and other programs, but right. we still see limited progress. Right. And so I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about that, the lack of progress and how Sea Change intends to address some of that. Uh, you're absolutely right. And and part of the part of the issue is that the things that are going on are going on outside of the core of the institution. Okay, it's a program over in this department or a program over in this unit 
or program in this college. It's not necessarily that it's something that is being embraced by the entire institution. And what do I mean by that? You mentioned that I was a trustee of, mm -hmm. of Caltech and I was a region of Morgan State. Mm -hmm. um, where do these things ever end up in the regular budget? They don't. Thank you. <laughs> where do they change the, the expected behavior? Where are they? Can you go find them? Can you find remnants of them? That's the problem. They don't change the basic structure of the institution. Mm -hmm. If you want something to make a difference, it has to make a difference. Be, and it has to be incorporated into the regular way that the institution is doing business. i give you an example. Okay, so maybe you have a, a you could hire somebody on an opportunity hire. Mm -hmm. Okay, but opportunity hires aren't the way that the regular people get hired. So the next person that gets hired, how do they go? Do they go back to the way that they did before? Mm -hmm. Or do they incorporate the learning that came from that opportunity hire? If you're looking at issues of um, a, summer, a, a summer program, for example, to bring students in early so that they can like make up the whatever kinds of deficiencies that they might bring, that's still on the student. What happens in the weed out courses are people being called it, it, are pe people being held accountable. What do we know about the retention in those courses? <clears throat> what do we know about how the students actually perceive these courses? What is the learning within these courses? Do we know who is selectively leaving? I, I think that in many cases, it is the lack of at of asking these questions that leads us to uh, allow the system to just go on the way that it has always gone on. The institutions were not built with us in mind and they were not built by us. The traditions and the climates and the norms that are a part of the institution have never been examined in many cases. Nobody has ever said, why six years and out? And I know that advance in many institutions has been very successful <clears throat> in terms of getting the stop the clock. But it matters how stop the clock gets, gets um, implemented. Do you have to ask to have the clock stopped? We've begun to understand that in many cases, where you just stop the clock for whomever is in that situation, <clears throat> that that's much more effective. And I think that the that asking ourselves these kinds of questions, and I'll give you another example. Has anybody said anything within the institution about the availability of stop the clock because of COVID responses? You know, with uh, schools closed and and children at home, the duty of care falls disproportionately on women. So, have we said anything about the fact that they are not publishing as much? That they may not be putting in as many proposals? Do we have a mechanism to be able to respond so that when they come up for, when they come up for tenure, that they don't get dinged for that? I think this notion of how we are able to respond to um, the the needs that are out there that are quite clearly, you know, you, you can, we can see them, uh, but they're not a part of the regular operating procedures of the institutions. They are not a part of the regular budgeting 
of the institution. If I were concerned about teaching and were hiring people who not only were able to do research, but they, they were in fact able to teach, what is their teaching philosophy? What do we know about their teaching experience? And is there any way for us to provide um, instruction so that they can do a better job of teaching in a way that is uh, that does support the students? Um, the, is it an expectation that they are going to be measured on? Um, is it going to affect promotion or tenure or like all these other institutions that are out there they are only looking at the proposals that you write the money you bring in the papers you publish pay much less attention to teaching even when it's inadequate and hardly any attention to service and we know that in many cases that our women and our um, and faculty of color uh, have disproportionate advising responsibilities. They are taking on more service. Uh, but does it count? Does anybody count it? Does anybody hold it up as being something that should be valued? So I think that there's, that's one of the things about sea change. Guess what? When you start into down the road on sea change, you know, all these questions I ask you just right now, that's in sea change. It's a scaffolded set of questions that began to help you think through how to make this into a, uh, a structural shift, not just a one-time shift, but something that is considered and baked into the structure. And that's where we lose, I think that that's where we lose a lot of ground. Uh, we've got to figure out what do we want? What are we going to need for the long term? Not the short run, but the long term in terms of making this happen. Many of the women, for example, complain that I, that I have met women faculty. They don't know what it takes to get to be a professor. They can get, and they can get stuck at associate professor with tenure. Does the institution require that there be meetings to talk about performance and to talk about, to make transparent what it requires, what the expectations are to become a professor. It shouldn't be some kind of a secret. <laughs> you can't aspire to something that is not clearly articulated. And so I, 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 I use these as examples I am sure that the audience can present many more examples of things of where they are barriers and they get stuck. Uh, but the, 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 the notion is we've got to somehow figure out how to get that embedded in the standard operating procedures of the institution. Great, great. We do have some questions that have come in for you. Uh, one of our uh, audience members asked, could you address how an individual faculty member may improve the climate for URM groups? Under I, th group? I think that, the, that an individual faculty member can actually um, uh, invite community. Mm -hmm. I think that is a, that's a, a wonderful way to do it. When I was an individual faculty member, long time ago, but I was, I offered to do a seminar and um, invited students to, to come to the seminar. In addition to the, uh, the seminar topic, uh, we also talked about careers. Mm -hmm. We talked about um, graduate education. We talked about all the things that I wouldn't normally get a chance to talk to them about and I could have done that one on one right mm -hmm. I could have just had them in my they come to my office hours and do that one on one but by having them together that was a way of actually building community they became aware that they weren't the only ones thinking about these things so there is a way involving students if you have a researcher uh, 
effort involving the students in the research, uh, including research questions, asking the students about the research and the questions that they have within their own community. So there are things that can be done to try to help build this, this kind of like sense that they're not isolated. And I think that that is absolutely critical. Thank you. Another um, participant wants to know, how would you suggest we create capacity building to remove explicit and implicit systemic barriers in a mo more proactive manner rather than wait on the data to point out disparity gaps and imploring us to take action? Things well, you are absolutely right. One of the things that um, uh, the first question is that um, you've got to collect your own data. Yeah. I mean, I could tell you national data to a fairly well. That's not what the issue is. The issue is your data. Mm -hmm. What do we know about our students? What right. what kind of information do we have? Who sh who comes? Who leaves? Why do they leave? Um, understanding um, the who's in our weed out classes mm -hmm. um, what are their aspirations are they there is potential majors are they undecided are they um, transfers are there students who are just there because they're in a service uh, because it's a service course um, I always look at that I, I say that in, instead of having these intro courses as weed out courses, we need to consider them opportunities to, for seduction, <laughs> enticing people into our fields, yeah. Yeah. not just not pushing them out. And so it starts with the data, okay? Mm -hmm. Sharing the data, discussing the data, what did the data mean, mm -hmm. all right? And then moving to something like talking about leaving revisited where the research says what the data don't mean because mm -hmm. many cases the the first thing that people want to say is the students couldn't hack it mm -hmm. well that you don't necessarily know that because the data over here telling us that the students who are coming with strong math and other kinds of backgrounds they're just deciding they don't want to be there and so the the moving beyond assumptions. And I think that is the thing that really can build. Um, don't let people get away, you know, especially people in STEM, they shouldn't be allowed to get away with making these assumptions. Where are your data? Ask them all the time. Where's the research that, that supports what you say? Where are your data? That's right. <laughs> So we have another question. We have time, I think, for maybe two more. We'll see. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on reinventing the wheel, or would you drive your change based on data or feedback from students, staff, and faculty? I think you've sort of answered that question, but the the idea is when you're really trying to implement new change, how much of tradition do you hang on to and how much do you throw out? If it doesn't work for you, get rid of it. That's what my, that's my my issue. I, I don't mind wheel reinvention. What you don't want is reinventing the flat tire. Yes. <laughs> and in some of the cases, the things that have been around for a long time work. And in some of the cases, the things that have been around for a long time stopped working a long time ago. That's right. And uh, I think that you you got to look at the look at the data to the extent that you can and be informed by the data. So our last question, Dr. Malcolm, is what is your take on family and career balance for young women in very challenging times, such as what we are now? Their life and career, in both cases, their clock is ticking. Men bureaucrats always say she has small kids and can't do her job. How do we look at that and any suggestions for females like myself going through every day, single, every single day? Okay, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, I had kids. I have two daughters and three grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And I watched one of my daughters with the two kids trying to do school and trying to do her work. And she's, at, she's employed at the university um, as their chief institutional research officer. And 
they're in the middle of accreditation. Mm. So I need to say no more. I get it. But let me just say this. Forget the idea of balance. You cannot balance it. You've got to do, you got to think integration, career and life integration. Um, you got to think also on two other things. One is that if you have a partner, they need to be involved. You cannot do it by yourself. But a lot of people, fortunately, have extended family, the aunt or grandmother. I told you I came from a multi-generational household. Uh, or you need to adopt some mothers <laughs> and grandmothers. Uh, that's the role of, of those of us who are kind of like on the other side of mid-career. Um, that to try to help, to try to support those of you who are still striving. But my, my issue is to do not try to do it all and that your institution ought to be able to allow for some relief. In the, we are all in this together and it should not be a matter that you are carrying this load in addition to the other and ask the institution about what kinds of, of uh, supports uh, that you can get uh, during this time. Great, thank you. So Dr. Malcolm, we've really sort of come to the end of our time, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to share any parting words or thoughts that you might have. And I would then like to wrap this up by sharing some information about upcoming um, workshops that we've scheduled for the next few months. So uh, the, 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 the last thing I want to say is thank you. Thank sure. you, sure. Dr. Dilworth, Pauline, Paulette. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Paulette, Thank you. for letting me come and invade your space. Um, I don't have any great wisdom to impart, um, except that you do the best you can. And that, I think, is the way that we have all made it. <laughs> we so do cool. the best we can under the circumstances that we have been presented and use this as an opportunity to really challenge some of the things that are that are just not working. Not working for you now. They didn't work before mm -hmm. in some cases. So let's essentially take this opportunity to say we need Jeez. to require, to ask that the institution really consider who we are and what our needs are going forward. Great. great. Thank you so much, Dr. Malcolm. And just so the audience knows, we will post, we've recorded this session and it will be posted on the ODEI website so that you can go back and review or uh, invite your friends or colleagues to review as well. And I also would like to add that we have some upcoming workshops that are sponsored by Advance um, that have also been posted on the ODEI website. We can send that link out to you um, after the session ends today. But I really want to say thank you to all who took time out to participate. And again, thank you, Dr. Malcolm. We really appreciate all the wisdom he shared with us. And I will be looking forward to the next Sea Change event. So thank you again. OK, thank you. Uh, and I'm a, I apologize for my oh, no worries. problems. Right, okay. no worries. Thank okay. you so and much. And I hope they edit that part out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Have a good day, everyone. You too. Thank you.